Nations, we present one of America's top spine tinglers, a radio rebroadcast of a program dedicated to the mysterious, the unusual, and sometimes the supernatural. A program of suspense. This is the truth. Do you understand? the truth. It must be the truth. It has to be. I, Robert Winsley Graham, a doctor and psychiatrist by profession, do hereby of my own free will and volition, albeit with deepest regret, make the following full and complete statement relative to that all but unbelievable series of events which has brought such disaster and misfortune to my house particularly to my poor wife, Isabel. It had its beginning, properly speaking, some two months ago, to be exact, on the evening of July 25th. We were in the drawing room, Isabel at the piano, practicing, as she said. Her Aunt Jane and I on the opposite sides of the room. Isabel, what's the matter? I don't know. I can't seem to keep my mind on anything anymore, even my music. <laughs> Nerves. Nerves. <laughs> Isabel. Yes, Robert. I don't wish to distress you, but it's been going on for quite a little while now. It's not getting any better. I know. Let's not discuss it, shall we? We should let me prescribe treatment for you. I could, could prescribe something for her. You can do remarkable things now with just the common old drugs under proper control. Drugs. It's not drugs that she needs. It's to get out of this house for a while. It's to get back to the concert stage where she belongs. It's work. Aunt Jane, please. I'm sorry. I don't believe in beating around the bush. You're an artist. You've got talent. There's no sense in your trying to subordinate yourself to somebody else. Aunt Jane, that's enough. I'm not subordinating myself to anyone. Really, Aunt Jane, you mustn't interfere, you know. Robert doesn't want me to go back on the stage. Darling, it isn't that I don't want you to go back. I'm proud of you. You know that. It's only because I think... Because I know that going back to a professional career in your present mental condition would be terribly harmful. I know, Robert. I know you're right. Oh, after all, I'm, I'm a doctor. It's my business to know these things. I, I'll get it. Probably the hospital. Hello. Hello? Oh, yes, it's Dr. Graham. Oh, yes. It's for... Who? Huh. Well, when, when would you like to see me? All right. Fine. No, 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 no trouble at all. I... Very well, I'll be expecting you. Good goodbye. Isabel, good heavens. Who do you suppose that was? Who? Roger Holcomb. Do you remember the case? Roger Holcomb? I remember it. Of course you do. The fellow was brought back from the dead, as the newspapers put it, about a year ago. Oh, yes. Huh. Well, he really was dead for four full minutes, as far as medical science was concerned. Then Bates brought him around. It was nine days' wonder at the time. Well, what does he want to see you about? I don't know. Something to do with his experience, obviously. He was in a terribly agitated state. Poor fellow had been walking up and down in front of the house for an hour trying to get up courage to ring the bell. Finally, phoned from the corner drugstore. Why, the poor man. Why in the world should he do that? Anxiety neurosis. They hounded him, you know, in the most shocking way. Got out of the hospital. Preachers and spiritualists, movie agents, just plain fakers. People trying to find out if he remembered anything of the four minutes. He was supposed to be dead. People just trying to exploit him. Oh, must be Holcomb now. Take him into the office. Dr. Graham? Yes, you're Roger Holcomb? Yes. Come in. Thank you. to meet you, Mr. Holcomb. Yes, sir. You come this way, please, my office. 
Can't just sit down anywhere. Lie down on the couch if you like to. Try it. I am tired. Tired and dead. Give me your hand, please. For heaven's sake, there's nothing wrong with my pulse. If that's all you think it is, I'll go. Why did you come to me, Mr. Holcomb? You know my history? Yes, most medical men do. Up until your uh, disappearance. Yeah, most medical men do, all right. Then they tell me I'm crazy. Do you think you are, Mr. Holcomb? Oh, I see. You're like all the rest. Let go of me, please. Just, just a minute, right. Mr. Holcomb. You came to me for advice. For treatment. Just you tell me your story. Well, I was told you, you specialize in strange cases. Hmm. Things that other men can't explain. Well, that's true in a way. Uh, you know what happened when I got out of the hospital. Yes. Yeah. Followed me, questioned me, hounded me, day and night, trying to find out if I remembered anything, if I'd experienced anything beyond the grave. Yes, I remember that. Well, the, then you remember that my answer was always the same. That I remembered nothing, that I knew nothing. Well, I was wrong. Oh? What did you experience during those four minutes? I don't know. But it must have been something. Something I don't even dare to think about. How do you know this? Well, it, it happened the first time on a, on a boat trip, which I'd taken to recover my health. I, I found myself chatting with a woman who was seated at my table in the dining saloon. She found occasion, as such women often will, to mention her age. She said, after all, I'm not yet 40. And then it happened. What happened? Well, from somewhere came crashing into my mind a certain knowledge of the exact day and year of that woman's birth. Hmm? And with it, a compulsion to speak out. A compulsion which I could no more have resisted than I could have resisted breathing. I said, Madam, you were born in May, weren't you? May 30th. And she looked at me in utter astonishment. We'd never even seen each other before in our lives. And said, yes. And, and then I added the date, the year 1900. See, she was well over 40. She'd lied to me. Innocent enough thing, but I had known the truth. And I'd been forced to speak. And I have been ever since. This uh, phenomenon has occurred often? More times than I can remember. Every time a direct lie, no matter how trivial, is uttered in my presence, I suddenly know the answer to that lie. I know the truth. And I'm compelled to speak it. Mm. And this condition has existed only since your... Uh... Since my four minutes beyond the grave, mm. yes. Quite. It's as though, in that brief time, I, I glimpsed eternity. As if I'd seen reveal all truth of all the ages... I can never tell you how horrible that seems. I found that men, even the most honest of men, live by lies. Tell me, you have a family, friends who are understanding? Oh, for heaven's sake, Doctor, don't you understand what this has done to me? Yes, I had a family and friends, a girl I was going to marry. Today I'm, I'm an outcast, pariah. I'm, I'm shunned, feared, I, I'm hated. Yes, hated. Mr. Holcomb. I... Mr. Holcomb, I believe that this condition is very real to you. It causes you very real anguish. I want to help you. Do you think you can? I'm confident that I can. Suppose you could arrange to stay with me here at my home for a matter of weeks or months, if necessary. Well, I'll do anything. Good. Anything in the world to be a normal man again, but... But what? Dr. Graham, I... I can see that you still don't believe me. Oh, no. I beg of you. You don't know the terrible responsibility I'd be to you. I'd be like a spy, like some inexorable prosecutor from another world. Mr. Holcomb, <laughs> let me worry about that. All right. Is there anyone else in your household who might object? Oh, no, it's only my wife and her aunt. You have your own quarters. Be quite comfortable, I assure you. I'm sure I'd be. It's a lovely house, but I've seen of it. Yes, I'm rather lucky. I'm interested in research primarily. Not much money in that, you know, but a couple of years ago, I came into quite a nice inheritance. The house went with it. What is it? What's the matter? The inheritance was not yours. It was your wife's. The house is your wife's. You were penniless. That's true. I don't know why I lied to you. Pride, I suppose. I I'm sorry. I told you I couldn't help it. No, no. I'll go now. <laughs> Please. Mr. Holcomb, it's my fault. It's a fall matter. Yeah, but you see now that I... I can... want to help you. Do you believe me now? I believe, Mr. Holcomb, either that you are far more ill than I realized or that in months to come, 
you and I must venture into a realm never before explored by mortal man. It was utterly fantastic, and yet it was true. I checked the facts again and again. He could not possibly have known, and yet he knew. Could you imagine what this meant to a man of science? If I could fathom the depths of Roger Holcomb's mind, I could make a contribution to the body of scientific knowledge absolutely without parallel in modern times. I'd be more famous than Pasteur or Ehrlich. There remained the problem of Isabel. I was aware of the danger, of course. I was acutely aware of the peculiarly delicate balance of her mind at that time. And the fact that the presence of a man like Roger Holcomb might, might be seriously detrimental to my rather well-conceived plans for Isabel. I believed I could control the situation. I determined to proceed. Actually, Holcomb's presence made itself felt almost immediately. The first incident came after his visit. Isabel, please stop that playing and listen to me. And Jane, you know Robert has said I mustn't talk about it, that it's bad for me. I don't care what Robert says. But he's my doctor and my husband. And I'm not sure that he should be either. Yes, Jane. I don't know much about psychiatry, but I do know that making trouble between a husband and a wife... I'm not making anything that isn't there already, and you know it. Good heavens, girl. Look at yourself. Look what's happened to you since your marriage. I've been sick. He's made you sick. That's ridiculous. Maybe it's just that he's afraid of losing you. Maybe he's even afraid of losing your money. But I'm absolutely convinced that whether he's meant to or not, he's made you believe there's something the matter with you that isn't. Aunt Jane, I simply forbid you to talk this way. And now he brings this, this psychopath into the house. And don't bring Roger into it. He's Robert's patient. It's Robert's work, and it's none of our business. What about your own work? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? Aunt Jane, you simply don't understand. Robert is my husband. I trust him, and I love him. Nothing can ever come between us. I'd destroy anything. I'd kill anyone who tried. Isabel. Isabel, do something before it's too late. Do what? Get away. Leave him. Divorce him. Anything. Oh, I hope we're not interrupting. Of course not, darling. Hello, Roger. Hello, Isabel. Good afternoon. How are you feeling, Roger? I'm better, I think. I think it would be better if we didn't discuss our states of mind, Isabel. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Well, would you like me to play something for you? You know, I think I'm beginning to get the feel of it again. Really, I do. You're sure we haven't interrupted some conversation? Of course not. We were just discussing how helpful you've been in getting Isabel back to her work again. Roger. No. No, you are not. You were telling Isabel to divorce her husband. Isabel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Roger, come back. Isabel, is that true? You brought him in here deliberately. Is that true? It doesn't matter, I suppose. You've known how I felt for a long time. Yes, I'm afraid I have. Robert, it was all so silly. She didn't mean it. It was just I did she... mean it. But I did mean it. I'm sorry, Isabel. But I've been under this roof too long as it is. Oh, Jane, you're not leaving us. It's this, Isabel. Yes. Yes, I think it's unquestionably best. Best that you go at once. She left us, of course. I'd always believed that Jane exercised an unfortunate influence over Isabel. I did not dream it had reached such a point as this. Yet this incident gave me my first insight into the relationship which was destined to develop between Isabel Roger and myself. The first and most obvious result was that within a matter of weeks, Isabel was to lose every friend she had. We became further estranged as each day passed. It was difficult to speak of even the most casual things with this, this strangely terrifying specter of truth, always at our elbow. The situation reached its inevitable climax the evening that Leopold Sarinsky, the famous conductor of the Los Angeles Symphony, was to call on Isabel with a view to resumption of her professional career under his auspices. I gave a great deal of thought to that evening. It had to be handled with a great... Robert, you will help me, won't you? Of course I will, darling. I don't know whether you realize how important it is to me. I have nothing but the music now. I've been working so hard. Playing sometimes half the night yes. while you were asleep. I've heard you. Sometimes it seems that... 
But the piano's all that's helping me to keep my sanity. Uh, my darling, I, I, I want you to let me prescribe something for you. It's time we face this thing, your trouble, I mean. Robert, does he have to have dinner with us tonight? Well, Roger, Isabel, you know how I stand on that. Oh, yes, but just this one. Even once, Isabel, to keep him in his room like a spoiled child and we have guests. Isabel, it, it might undo everything I've accomplished in weeks. Oh, of course. You're right. That's oh, Roger, come in. Robert, I, I was wondering if I mightn't be excused just tonight. Oh, no, you're having dinner with us, Roger. Must I? You know you must, Roger, and you know why. Why, Roger, don't you want to meet the great Leopold Serinsky? He's really a wonderful person. Oh, yes, indeed, I would very much. Uh... You know, I made my debut with him in 1934. I did a concert with him every year until my... Until I... Isabel... Who was very talented, you know. I was? <laughs> I am. Oh, Roger, I'm going to play with him again. He wants me to open the season in November. Can you imagine what that means to me? I'm so glad. That you're going and to... Robert has finally given his consent. <coughs> Haven't you, dear? I'm, I'm sorry. What was it you said, Isabel? I said you'd given your consent to my playing with Serinsky. Well, Isabel, you... You know I don't want you to think that I'd ever stand in your way. I know, dear. Roger, I'll do the Emperor Concerto, and you will come to hear me. You do want to, don't you, Roger? I... Please, Isabel, don't ask things of me that can't... What's the matter? What's the matter with both of you? You act as though you thought I wouldn't be able to appear. As though the whole idea were hopeless or something. Isabel, please. I am going to play. I'll be better than I ever was. You know I will, don't you? Don't you? Yes, of course, Isabel. You play wonderfully. Roger. No, Robert, you... You're very certain that Isabel will be prevented from ever playing again by death. Death? Oh, Isabel, forgive me, forgive me, please. By death? No. Oh, no. Please, Roger, it's not true. Tell me it isn't. Roger, answer me. Answer me. Roger, do you hear me? Answer me. Answer me! When Sorinsky arrived, I told him it would be quite impossible for Isabel to leave her room. The concert was canceled, and indeed, to my knowledge, she's never touched the piano since that day. By now, to even the most casual observer, it must appear only natural that Isabel had every motive for a desperate, almost paranoid hatred of Roger Holcomb. This much was clear to me. The rest, not yet. But one thing from any point of view was certain. I had to keep Roger and Isabel apart. Perhaps what I feared was indeed inevitable. I honestly did not think it so at the time. As a precautionary measure, however, I prescribed a drug for Isabel, which she at last consented to take. I gave her her own supply. She administered it to herself, as I had directed. Roger? Roger? Yes? It's Isabel. What do you want? Let me in, please. No. Please, it's terribly important. Robert said that I... I know. Not... But he said it would be all right this time. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, please. All right. Now, what do you want? I want to talk to you, that's all. What about it? It's so important. Roger, why don't you ever leave your room anymore? Can't you guess? Do you think I hate you? Isabel, I don't know what to think anymore. You do, don't you? I warned him. I, I told him it would happen. Now I'm going mad up here. I think of the anguish I've caused you. But, Roger, I don't. You must believe me. I know what it's been like for you having me here. Isabel. Roger, you see, for the first time in my life, I think my husband is wrong about something. Wrong? Yes. Don't you see? He's been worried about both of us. And so this, this distrust has grown up between us. Well, I, I don't distrust you, Isabel. You've been more wonderful to me than I'm But you're, you're afraid of me. And that amounts to the same thing. And it's bad for the both of us. It's, it's hurting both of us. Well, I've often felt I wanted to talk to you, to beg your pardon. Oh, you don't have to do that. We're both sick. But I think if we saw each other sometimes, if we talked the whole thing out, it would, it would help us both. Well, does, does Robert think so, too? No. Then... Then he didn't tell you it was all right to see me. No. I lied to you. You, you what? I lied to you. 
you like them. And, and it didn't happen. Isabel, don't you see? I am getting well. It didn't happen. I know. I don't think it does happen anymore. Except with Robert. With Robert? What makes you think I don't know. Off? Something about the way he acts. The way he is. Oh, but Isabel, he, he is curing me then. Perhaps you shouldn't have come No, up no, don't you understand? We must see each other. We must talk. No, listen. listen. Isabel. Robert. Something's happened that I'm afraid Please, you're completely it. overwrought. Oh, but Robert, it's... I Robert. must insist, Isabel. Why did you do this? I'm you sorry. You have to have a right away, Isabel. Get the bottle from your room. Mine? Yes, yes. Please, hurry. All right. Robert, she lied to me. Yes, yes, I know. But, Roger, I must I... absolutely forbid you to talk now. You must trust All me. All right, but uh, later I want to have a long talk with you. Of course we shall. Here it is. I brought my hypodermic, too. I'm glad you did. The other one's mislaid somewhere. Will you give it to him, please? I? Yes, I'm sorry, but this has upset me rather badly. My hands are shaking. Robert, I'm terribly sorry. No matter now, give him the hypodermic, the upper arm. That's right. There. Thank you. Leave us now, please, Isabel. All right. How are you feeling now, Roger? Well, I'm fine, Robert. I, I think I'm better than I've been in months. I know you're better. That's why I was so upset to see you. But why, Robert? I can't tell you all my reasons now, but you must trust me and believe in me. Oh, I do, but... Only that I'm afraid of your health. Roger. No. You're afraid of murder. What? Murder. Roger, listen to me. Roger. Murder. Roger, what are you talking about? Roger. Roger! It was clear to me now. I knew I must take immediate action. I knew that the most terrible consequences might result if Isabel were alone with Roger, even for a moment. But he knew that he'd said so. There was no other explanation. I thought it through most carefully. And yet no plans are perfect. No man is infallible. Isabel! Robert! What are you doing? Nothing. Don't lie to me, Isabel. I'm not. I'm you were just... coming from Roger's room. No. No, I swear I won't. Isabel, don't you understand that you're sick? That I've insisted on these things for your own good and his. All right. I was going to talk to him, but I had not Oh, Isabel. Why do you try to tell me that? But it's true, Robert. Really true. Is it? Roger. Roger. What's the matter? Look. Robert. No, it couldn't be. It is. He's dead. Dead? Hypodermic by his side. The drug, your drug, your hypodermic. But it's only a sedative. Except that in large enough quantity, it's fatal. You knew that. Oh, Robert, don't listen to Isabel, me. Isabel, why? Why, I warned you. Robert, look at me. It's Isabel. It's your wife. You can't... Oh, no. Where are you going? Come back. I'm going to call the police. Perhaps the most terrible decision a man ever had to make, even though it did come not as a shock to me, even from my point of view as a scientist. It was terrible enough. Yet it had to be done, and I had done it. I did not speak to her as we waited, and she made no further attempt to appeal to me. She seemed utterly stupefied, perhaps as a result of the drug she herself been taking. Perhaps because she suddenly realized she was hopelessly trapped. The police arrived, I told the story with a little emotion. Fingerprints, all right, on both the bottles. Those would be hypodermic. my wife's, of course. They both belong to her. Is that true, Mrs. Graham? Yes. Dr. Graham, do I understand, then, that you are formally charging your wife with the murder of Roger sure. Holcomb? Well, you could hardly expect me to do that, could you? I'm simply telling you the facts. Yes, but you said she hated Holcomb, and you knew it. My wife has been mentally ill for some time. There are many people who can testify to that. You'll plead insanity, of course. Well, Dr. Graham, I can't tell you how sorry I am, but... Things you have told me add up to only one thing, as you yourself obviously recognize. Yes. Your wife, Isabel Graham, murdered Roger Holcomb. What did you say? I said your wife, Isabel Graham, murdered Roger Holcomb. No. I murdered him. What? 
I tried to make it appear that Isabel had done it. And I succeeded. But I killed him. No plans are perfect. No man is infallible. Yes, I killed Roger Holcomb. And he himself revealed the truth. I'd planned to dispose of Isabel for many months. I'd never loved her. I'd loved only science. I wanted her money and Holcomb found it out. That was the risk I ran. But any chance lie in his presence, either by Isabel or myself, bring out the truth, and it did. I had no alternative once he'd discovered that. But to kill him, it's easy enough to throw the blame on Isabel. I had not counted on that terrible compulsion for the truth. That strange affliction of Roger Holcomb and his power over me. Did it transfer itself at his death to me? Or was it Pity that it had to end this way. It was a fascinating case. And so closes Lazarus Walks, starring Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This rebroadcast is a presentation of the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents The Man Who Died Twice... Starring John Sutton and Patricia Morrison. Artie McDowell is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. You know, we sometimes meet people who say, there can't be an all-wise and good God because there's too much evil in the world. And they deny the existence of God because of all the evil they see. And yet, most of us know that the wrong we do comes into our lives when we put God out, when we don't pray. And the evils of the world exist because so often we try to run things without God, because we forget the language of prayer. You don't find people giving themselves sincerely and earnestly to God and prayer and at the same time spending their lives doing harm to others. These things don't go together. And in a home where family prayer is part of family life, you don't find juvenile delinquents or parental delinquents or all the other home crimes that make newspaper headlines. Crime and prayer just don't go together. And when there's prayer in a home... And when a home is run with God's help and God's guidance, 
when family prayer is a daily part of family life, there's no doubt about the existence of God. It's seen every day in the goodness and the happiness in that home. Roddy McDowell will speak following tonight's family theater story, The Man Who Died Twice, starring John Sutton and Patricia Morrison. Good evening, Mr. Grant. Good evening, George. Your coat, sir? Oh, yes, thank you. Is Mrs. Grant at home? I... Oh, it's you, Stephen. Didn't expect you home so early. Oh, well, you see, I... Oh, you're going somewhere, Claire? <laughs> yes, Bill Carter and the gang giving a little get-together at the Parisian. Oh, I see. They asked if you wanted to come. Oh, well, it's... But I knew you wouldn't be interested. Oh. Well, it's eight o'clock. I'd better go. Yes, you better run along, dear, and have a good time. I know you'll be busy. As a matter of fact, Phil gave me a couple of scripts that I'm reading. Oh, that's fine, dear. I do think you should be getting another picture soon. Well, I'm not sure that either of the parts is quite right for me, but you know how it is. Darling, do try to make a selection. Remember, 20 million women swoon when Stephen Grant appears on the screen. I wish you'd forget those publicity releases. Now, look, Claire. Stephen, if the card is called, will you tell them I'm on my way? Yes, I'll tell them. Good night, Claire. Good night, Stephen. Well, George? The uh, usual, Mr. Grant? With two cubes, George. Oh, pardon me, sir. Mr. Grant's residence? Oh, yes, Mr. Martin. Just a moment, I'll... If that's Phil Martin, I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Hello, Phil. How's Hollywood's number one agent? Fine, Sam, fine. Well, I'm glad you called, Phil. I've skimmed through those two scripts you gave me, oh... I was thinking about that part in the Scarlet Scarf. You know, I might be able uh, to do a great deal. Look, champ, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. That part was set this afternoon. Ted Shallot's going to do it. Ted Shallot? Why, he's no more right for that look, part champ, than... Look, champ, you know the geniuses of Metropolitan. Once they get an idea on casting... Well, sure you're not going to try to sell me on that other script. It's the most inane thing no, I've ever champ, read. champ, I'm not trying to sell you on it. That deal was locked up, too, just an hour ago. Then what's the idea of giving me scripts that have already been cast? Look, Phil, I'm a busy Take man. It easy, champ. Now, here's the pitch. Uh, I ran into something over at Capitol. I think you'd be mighty interested in it. Oh. What kind of story is it? It's going to be one of the biggest things of the season. Take my word for it, champ. Oh, it's good, eh? All right, send it over. I'll read it the first chance I get. Okay, but I wanted to give you a line on this part. How it uh, may not look too big... But the whole picture hinges on it. Well, if it's the lead, it can certainly be padded out. And... Well, uh, that's what I was getting at, champ. It's not exactly the lead. Not the lead? Oh, say, what are you trying now, to do? listen, champ, let's put it this way. It's been a year since your last picture. I've been knocking my brains out for you, and this is all I could come up with. Well, if that's all you've got to say, no, you can... No, I've got one thing more, champ. Uh, maybe it's hard to take, but it looks like you're going to have to start doing second leads for a while. Yeah? Well, to me, it looks like I need a new agent. <laughs> What you need is a good night's sleep, Jeff. Talk to you in the morning. Good night. Hello, champ. I've been waiting out here. I wanted to talk to you before we saw Masterson. Uh, you know, Phil, I wouldn't have considered this appointment at all if it weren't for any other producer. But, Matty, you know, we've done some good things together. <laughs> I'm glad you thought it over, champ. I know you're going to like the part. Why, Matty and I worked together on Stars of Love, my first award. You remember that, Phil? Yeah. Crandall did the screenplay. Now, if we could get Crandall for special dialogue uh, in this one... Look, would... champ, uh, let me do most of the talking, will you? I think we'll be able to swing a good deal. Well, here we are. You know, I heard that Crandall's on the coast now. Hello, Polly. You? Just as beautiful as ever, aren't you? Still want to marry me? Don't answer that. <laughs> Matty's waiting for us, Polly. I'll go right in. Well, here we are, Matty. And don't forget now, treat my client here with a little respect. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hello, Maddie. Long time. Sounds, Steve. I, I suppose Phil told you about the script. Uh, not too much. I told him this was going to be a great picture, Maddie. I don't see how you can miss. 
Nothing's been done like it since Ben heard. I marked your part, Steve. Here, take a look at it. Yeah. That's a good title. It's a period piece, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, well, you might call it that. Say, wait a minute. This is the story uh, Maddie's of... going to do it in color, champ. Cast of thousands, real production. Phil, you didn't tell me what kind of story this was. Well, uh, I wanted you to see for yourself, champ. I knew you'd go for it as soon as you caught the angle. Well, that's where you're wrong, Phil. I'm not going for it. What? I've been a leading man for seven years. A romantic lead, remember. Now you expect me to take a part like this? You must be out of your mind. Steve, I don't think you quite understand what this is. I understand, character... all right. Wouldn't Stephen Grant look magnificent in a costume of muslin cloth? With a beard yet? Oh, why, I'd be laughed off the screen. Look, champ, I, I think that you should... Thanks for the call, Matty. This just isn't for me. Well, I guess you're right, Steve. It's not the kind of character you'd understand. Why, I understand every character I do. But not never... this one. Now, look, Matty. I'll send you a couple of tickets to the preview. So long, Steve. Oh, Mr. Grant, I I didn't know you were home. Hello, George. Is there something I can get for you, sir? No, not tonight, thanks. I've been looking through these books. George, uh, do we have a New Testament around the house? A testament, dear? Oh, hello, Claire. It's It's not important at all. Claire, what are you doing this evening? Do you have any plans? Well, they're opening a new club on the Strip, and Bill Carter says it's simply... Look, why don't you call Bill Carter and tell him you can't make it? Claire, we could have dinner here, just the two of us. We don't see much of each other. Stephen, you didn't get the part. Well, what's that got to do with it? Is it some sort of a crime for a man to ask his wife to stay home one night in a month? Every single night, I'm coming in and you're going out. It's just like a bus terminal. Claire, I don't like the way you're chasing around. Stephen, dear, you're morose. You don't want me here. You just want someone to argue with. Oh, I understand you exactly. So, you understand me. Matty understands the story. I suppose I'm the only man on God's green earth that's incapable of understanding anything. Now, listen to me, Claire. This merry-go-round's got to stop, and I'm... Oh, Stephen! Stephen, now I know what it is. You saw the bill from the jewelers. You really ought to pay it, dear. It's the second notice. Send them a check. What I'm talking about... But, darling, people should have money in the bank before they write checks. You mean to say your allowance... All of it's gone? Since last month. I thought you knew. How am I to know? I never question you. Anything you want, you can have. Anything to keep you happy. Oh, so I'm happy. And our home, I suppose, that's happy too. You sit around the house all these months brooding, feeling sorry for yourself. I know about those parts you've been offered, Stephen. Something always seems to be wrong. It couldn't be that you're slipping, could it? Thank you, Claire. You're just the one I wanted to hear that from. Hello, Phil. <laughs> Look, Phil, I, I guess I kind of blew up in Matty's office today. I, I'd like you to tell him I've reconsidered the part. I think it might work. Uh, with a few changes, of course. Save the lights! Quiet over there! This is a take. Quiet! Ready when you are, Mr. Masterson? Now, Steve, the idea here is that you're a disbeliever. Your sisters tried to convince you, but to no avail. You're not quite sure of your argument, yet you've got to justify your position. All right. Shall we try it? Ready with the lights. First take. Shooting 1793, take one. Quiet, please. Camera. Action. Music. You look on me as a disbeliever. What proofs do you bring forth for me to understand? Only this. You say he goes about the countryside doing good. His only wish to help and heal the sick. And yet I say all this is only rumor. Now let me ask, what wonders have you seen by this man's hand? Do you make me the man who walketh in the night because... because... Oh, I'm sorry, Matty. Cut! I can't get that line, Matty. It's the man who walketh in the night because the light is not in him. We'll try it again. Okay, mark that. An hour for lunch back on the set at one, and that means one o'clock sharp. 
How'd it go this morning, champ? Saw the last scene. Thought it looked pretty good. No, that was the twelfth take, Phil. I still don't think it's right. Oh, oh, quit worrying, will you? You'll get the hang of it, champ. You always do. Ah, oh, I almost forgot. Got a message for you. Here. All right. Claire, where do you see her? Outside the commissary. Say, you want to go off the lot for lunch? Huh? I said you want to grab a bite over at the Elm House? Uh, she's waiting for me. You go on, Phil. Perhaps I'll join you later. Yeah, but champ... Hello, Stephen. Claire, your note said it was important. Uh, would you like some coffee? No, thanks. I'm going away, Stephen. I'm going to New York. Yo, what's the idea? I think it's a sensible thing to do. Uh, I think we'll be happier apart for a while anyway. Claire, if it's about last night, if you came here to make a scene... There isn't I... going to be any scene, Stephen. It's plain and simple. I'm leaving you. Now, look there. I've got work to do. It's true as we haven't been getting along too well, but I put up with every one of your whims, and I won't have you running off to New York. Why, the gossip columns would eat it up, and I'm in no position for that kind of publicity. There'll be no publicity, Stephen. I'll see to it that everything's done quietly without any fuss. Regardless, I tell you, I won't have it. I'm afraid you're making the scene. Listen, Claire, what is this anyway? What are you trying to prove? We've had arguments before. Last night was once too often. Oh, let's be honest, Stephen. Oh, you want to be honest. Well, let's be very honest. All right. Marriage isn't a part in a movie, Stephen. You enter into it for better or worse. Oh, so this is the worst. Is that what you're trying to say? You didn't expect a happy ending, did you? We haven't been playing it for that kind of tag. Could be, Claire. No, Stephen. You played it for yourself. Well, I... I really must be going. The super chief leaves in an hour. Good luck on the picture. Listen, Claire... Goodbye, Stephen. <laughs> So he speaks of a man who had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence, the other 50. And whereas they had not wherewith to pay, he forgave them both. Which, therefore, of the two loved him the more? Which? Which? No. Maddie, I tell you, this isn't right. How do you expect an actor to read lines like this? Cut! Cut! It's archaic. There's no life in these lines. Some pretty fair writers wrote the New Testament, Stephen. All right, all right. Maybe it reads fine in a book. But how in heaven's name do you expect an actor to make it believable? This isn't Shakespeare. It isn't even prose. Matty, there's going to be a rewrite. You'll read that script as written, Stephen. Or you won't read it at all. You said that, Matty. I didn't. Send my two weeks to Phil's office. I'm through. Hey, champ. Well, wait a minute. Shut up, Phil. You can't walk off the set. You'll get blacklisted in every studio in town. Amp, look, Maddie's played good pool with you. I'm through, you understand? I quit. I'm finished. You can say that again. You're good and finished. That's all for tonight. On the set at nine for you folks. Good night. Champ, you're a fool. You're worse than that. You're a well-cured piece of ham that nobody's going to touch with a ten-foot pole. Phil, agents, don't talk to me that way. You can cancel our contract here and now. Get yourself another meal ticket. I'll cancel that contract, all right, Stephen. And you might save it for cutting out cupid dolls. It'll give you something to do. <laughs> Movie Roundup. Your screenland reporter hears tonight that Stephen Grant, in a fit of good old fashioned Hollywood temperament, walked off the set during production of J.D. Masterson's latest epic. Rumor has it that Mr. Grant may well have walked his way into oblivion. Grant's longtime glamour boy and. Longtime glamour boy. <laughs> All right, pull over! City built those stop signs for you to read. Maybe you don't like the way they printed. Look, if I've gone through a light, give me a ticket and let's get it over with. You went through three of them. Been drinking, buddy? No, I haven't been drinking. Say, wait a minute. You're Stephen Grant, ain't you? Yes, I'm Stephen Grant. Well, running lights is pretty dangerous business, Mr. Grant. All right, so nothing happened. Give me a ticket if you're going to and yeah, I might have killed somebody. I'm in a hurry, do you mind? I wouldn't get tough about it, Mr. Grant. Just trying to explain. The explanations bore me. Give me the ticket. I might do better than that. I might pull you in. I see here. A word for me to the commissioner. I You'll don't be... think it would do any good, Mr. Grant. The commissioner doesn't like your pictures. Listen to me. I if see you... your driver's license. Here you are. 49 Metcalf Road. Is that the right address? Yeah. Is your wife home? Yes, my wife's... Well, that is, there's someone there. My man, George. I see. Start up your motor, Mr. Grant. Follow me. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, why, Mr. Grant. That's all right, George. The officer was just seeing me home. I'll leave you here, Mr. Grant. I wouldn't drive anymore tonight, or you're apt to be picked up. Good night. Good night. Oh, uh, one more thing. What is it? I forgot to give you this ticket. You can appear in court or mail a fine. It shouldn't cost more than 50 bucks. Good night. Well, George, it appears that I've been remanded to your custody. Mrs. Grant hasn't come in as yet, sir. Yeah, I know. George, I believe we'll be closing up the house shortly. I'm going to take an apartment in Brentwood. Closing the house, sir? Yes, Mrs. Grant and I have separated. I... I expected that, sir. You what? It's been rather... If you'll pardon me, sir... Rather obvious for some time. (laughs) Yes, I suppose it has. It's funny about these things. It seems the husband and wife are always the last ones to know. One can be so close to oneself, sir, and yet so far away. Say, that's a good line, George. I wish I had something like that to read in the picture. Why, I heard about it on the radio tonight, sir. I'm I'm sorry. George, uh, tell me something, and tell me honestly. Do you think I'm a has-been? Well, it depends, sir, on what you're referring to. As an actor, you will always be the finest. But as... As what, George? Well, let me put it this way, sir. My father used to say, a man can't be a has-been if he happens to be a never-was. I don't follow you. Mr. Grant, you asked for something the other night. A book. This book. Oh, the Testament. Always before, sir. When you had a difficult part, I remember how you studied. Did research if necessary. How you paced the floor at night reading aloud. Breaking the part down, putting it together again. Making certain you understood every facet. Every movitation of the character you were to play. You always understood, Mr. Grant. That was it, sir. Understanding. But, George, this is something different. I lived those stories. You can't expect me to live the part of Lazarus. I've never been a religious man. During the time of Lazarus, sir, there were many who disbelieved until the Lord raised him from the dead. To try and believe. Could that be the answer? The only answer, sir. An understanding. Will I ever be able to understand? I think you're already begun to understand, sir. We'll use a double camera on the crowd scene. Get everything set up. Uh, Yes, Mr. Max. And get Thompson on the set. He's playing Lazarus. Give him a quick rundown on the part. Tell him about the crucifixion scene and what... Stephen, what are you doing here? Maddie, I want to talk to you. We're getting ready for rehearsal, Stephen. I don't have much time. Try me at the office next week. It's about the part, Maddie. I want you to give me another chance. We've already called Thompson. Maddie, Thompson's on the way up. He'll get thousands of jobs. He doesn't need this. Oh. Well, if you're broke, Stephen, I can let you have it. No, it isn't that. I know this part, Maddie. I believe in it and I can live it. Stephen, I'd I'd like to, but I just... Maddie, I've got a hunch this might be my last chance. Oh, you're not really blacklisted, Steve. You can still get plenty of work. That isn't what I mean. Oh, I see. All right, Stephen. We'll talk it over. Wait in my office. Now, Steve, in this scene, you've been brought before the officials to explain what has happened. You know they seek a reason to condemn you, even possibly put you to death. Now, you want to explain simply and honestly, yet you're afraid of the opposition you find around you. All right? Yes, I went over it very carefully last night. Okay. Everyone ready? Let's go. We'll do only one rehearsal. We want to pick up some time today. Roll them. Music! Now, first, let him speak. Only this I know, that Mary Magdalene, my sister, first met him. And to her who was called a sinner, he said, Many sins are forgiven you, because you have loved much. Then believing him, she became his disciple. You say you live in Bethany? Yes, 
And you were in the grave four days? Impossible. Ask any one of those who saw these things and now believe. Aye, but you were always of this group who called this man the Son of God. Nay, I too once sought to justify my disbelief by petty argument. But now I know that only one who comes from God could raise the dead to life. From these things he has taught, I came to understand that the greatest commandment is to love God with thy whole heart and thy whole mind and thy whole soul. For it profits not a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul. And the second commandment is like to this, to love thy neighbor. Then why have you so hated him that you now try to twist and turn the truth of all the things he has said and done? Okay, that's fine. We'll put a camera on it. We're here in the forecourt of Hollywood's premier theater. You've heard the stars. We brought them to our our microphone before curtain time, and now we're waiting for the conclusion of the performance. You know, critics have acclaimed this picture as one of the finest of the year. Moreover, it brings back to the screen Stephen Grant in a new role that most certainly be given top consideration when the awards are passed out. That applause you're hearing in the background means that the picture must be over and we'll be bringing more celebrities to the microphone. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, folks. Hold on. I believe I see Mr. Stephen... Oh, Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant, will you come over here, please? Mr. Grant, you, you seem to have slipped by us on the way in. I wonder if you'll say a few words to our radio audience. Tell us, Mr. Grant... This has been a radical departure from your other roles. Did you enjoy doing this picture? Yes, I did. I can truthfully say it has been the most unusual experience in my life. I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone connected with the production. To J.D. Masterson, the producer, to my manager, Phil Martin. And thanks most of all to a wonderful old man who gave me the most important thing, understanding. And George, if you're listening, thank you again. We appreciate your being here, Mr. Grant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet... Well, champ, looks like we're in. Yeah. Main events from now on. Look at these telegrams. You've got more offers than... What's the matter, champ? You wait here, Phil. There's a phone booth over there. I got a call to make. Let to get New York City, please. Larchmont 29401. It's a person-to-person call. Yeah, Mrs. Stephen Grant. Yeah, this is her husband. I'll wait. Hello? Yeah? Yeah, I'm still waiting. What's that? She's no longer at this number. Well, will you ask whoever answered the phone how I can get in touch with her? It's very important. Just turn her on, darling. Why, Claire. Hello, Stephen. Well... Hadn't you better hang up the phone? Claire, I wanted to write you. I wanted to call you. It's not like it was before. Things have changed. Why, why I've changed. I know, darling. Phil wrote me every week while you were in the picture. Claire, a fellow goes along all his life on a fence. He doesn't know which way to fall, and there's resentment and bitterness and all the petty things you get stored up inside. And you can't get rid of them because you don't know how. And you can't forgive because you don't know how. It's the same for a wife, Stephen. You can't love if you don't understand... Remember that line in the picture? What? Many sins are forgiven her because she hath loved much. You know, darling, once I wanted those very lines rewritten. But when you do grow to understand them, you kind of like them just the way they are. This is Roddy McDowell again. I guess we can all say that most of our difficulties come from a lack of understanding. It's the misunderstandings that begin most of the arguments, quarrels, and unhappiness in a family. Well, for example, like showing our appreciation to others for what they do. I guess it's the same with most young people. We get so busy with all the things we have to do, well, you just get to take a lot of things for granted especially things that are done for you by those who are as close to you as your mother and dad. And you know, sometimes when your family gets together and there's family prayer, well, it's quiet, and you get to thinking, and begin to understand how much your parents mean to you, 
and how much their example and encouragement have meant, and how their sincere faith in God has helped you to try to lead a good, useful, and God-respecting life. And you promise yourself that you'll live up to the ideals and example they have given you. Yes, most of us have a great deal to be thankful for. Why, we've been born in a generation when, despite all the confusion in the world, our parents are learning again the importance of family prayer and how closely it unites a family. And for our future homes, we've already learned that a family that prays together stays together. Before saying good night, I'd like to thank John Sutton and Patricia Morrison for their performances this evening, and our thanks to Mark Carney and Lou Reed for writing tonight's play, and to Max Tear for his music. This production of the Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Pat McGeehan, John Frank, Stu Wilson, Stan Waxman, Tim Graham, and Michael Hayes. Next week, our family theatre stars will be Kirk Douglas and Diane Douglas in Talent for Living. Your host will be Danny Thomas. This is Roddy McDowell saying good night and God bless you. This series of the Family Theatre broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at this same time when our Family Theatre stars will be Kirk and Diane Douglas with Danny Thomas as host, Tony Lafrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Uh, listen, you, uh, phone down to the drugstore and tell them to send up three gallons of black coffee. Who is this? Uh, are you sure you have the right number? I'm sure I've got the right number, but I'm not so sure who I am. Oh, Sam, it's you. You must have had a frog in your throat. Did you oversleep? Effie, don't say things like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Oh, you poor dear, you've been working. You're tired, that's it. Tired? I've only just brought Lazarus back from the dead. Well, then you better get some rest, Sam. You can dictate your report tomorrow. That's what you think. Now, stay where you are. If I'm asleep when I get there, wake me up. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Lazarus caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Next time you buy hair tonic, be sure you buy Wild Root Cream Oil. For you see, Wild Root Cream Oil gives you these advantages. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin, so much like the natural oil of your skin. Yes, friends, next time you buy hair tonic, look for that famous name, Wild Root. Get Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! 
Kathy! And you, Sam, in your private office. Yeah, private, she says. I'd like to know what's private about it. I have everything ready for you, Sam. What's this? Over here, to relax. I don't want to relax. I don't dare. Oh, there you go again, Sam. Going on nerves. How long do you think you can keep it off? With your help, I'll be in a coma inside three minutes. Thank you, Sam. Now, you just lie down here on the couch, and I'll take your shoes off. Now, look, uh... And I can take dictation while you relax. Nuts! Where's that black coffee? Sam, you're angry with me. Your eyes. Please don't glare at me like that, Sam. I can't bear it when you... I am not glaring. I'm trying to keep them open. Now, sit down. I gotta keep moving around. Oh, moving you around. Oh, you drive yourself like this, Sam. Yeah. Uh, please, Effie, please. Uh, date, uh, fill it in. What's your life? Go on. Bring yourself at both ends. Yeah, let's see. Uh, to uh, A.J. Tatspaw, claims manager, all-risk insurance company, Tide Building, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh. Dear sir, oh. the following is an accounting of my services to your company in connection with the claim of Emma R. Lazarus on the life of the assured Timothy R. Lazarus. The latter called at my office yesterday at approximately 11.30 a.m. He was tall, bald, gray-faced, and dusty. He looked as if he'd been buried and dug up several times. This, this may sound like a poor sort of jest, Mr. Spade, but my name is Lazarus, and I want you to bring me back from the dead. Well, sounds interesting. Why did you die, when did you die, and how did you die? I was declared dead by the appellate court of the state of California, August 28th last year, by reason of seven years' absence. Who took it to court? My wife, Emma. Insurance? Yes. My wife and I agreed between ourselves to insure my life in the amount of $100,000 that she would collect on legal presumption of death after my disappearance and continued absence for seven years. That's the law, Mr. Spade. Yeah, it's been tried a lot of times. What went wrong in your case? Wife double-cross you? If that's your attitude, I'm afraid I've come to the wrong man. Uh-huh. You're still in love with her. Well, that makes it tough. You know they'll nail her for perjury if you prove you're still alive? But that's why I didn't go to the police. Even though we'd planned the deception together, she had reason to believe that I was actually dead. Suppose you cover the whole thing from the beginning, Mr. Lazarus. Yes. I, I, I married her back in 1940. And for a while, we were happy. And then she became restless. You mean you were not able to support her in the manner to which she was accustomed? She was young, lovely, you wanted her to have nice things, but on your meager salary, it was impossible. Oh, I know, it's an old story, but life is like that. Well, uh, you said it. Yeah. Well, there you are. I was assistant cashier at the Golden Gate Bank. Oh, no, not that. I, I started taking small sums at first, meaning to repay them later uh, look, on. Let's not go through the whole script. How much did you embezzle? Uh, $20,000. Yeah, so you decided to take it on the lam before the auditors came in, and... I was going to give myself up, but Emma wouldn't let me. We, we made our plans that night, and uh, I left for Mexico the following day. In Mexico City, I had plastic surgery done on my face, and then I settled down to wait the seven long years until I would be declared legally dead. <laughs> I suppose you might call it poetic justice, but just before the end of the seventh year, I contracted malaria. I was confined to a hospital for more than 11 months. Mm, you have had it. Oh. The doctors gave me up for dead and asked me to notify my next of kin. I gave them Emma's address. I never notified it. To the contrary, because it seemed to, to, to fit in so well with our plan. Too well, huh? Yes. I, I'd i been to see her. And she refuses to believe that I am her husband. Oh, of course, my appearance is, is very much altered, but there must be some way to prove my identity. You worked in a bank. They must have taken your fingerprints. I removed them from the files and destroyed them. How are your teeth? My, my teeth? Teeth. Who was your dentist here in town? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, 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 Dr. Smith. The great professional building. He'll still have your dental x-rays on file. They're as good as fingerprints. You go there this afternoon. Don't give your name. Tell him you're Mark Humboldt. Have a new set of x-rays taken, and I'll do the rest. Uh, uh, what's your wife doing these days? Why, uh, Emma... Uh, Emma's married again. Who's the sucker? Pardon me? The man. Oh, he's a doctor. Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. Wilhelm? Uh, he's quite well known, I believe. Yeah, and the cops would like to know more. Now, about my fee... Uh... Oh, uh, Mr. Spade, I have no money. Oh, that's great. You have no money, and all you want is to hire a man to bring you back from the dead. And the more I succeed, the less chance I'll have of collecting. If I might make a suggestion, Mr. Spade, I... I don't know the ethics, but uh, perhaps the insurance company? You, you would be doing them a great service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to live, Mr. Lazarus. They can't keep a good man down. I'll collect from them. No 
a chance in a hundred thousand of shaking a fee out of your company. After all, you have your own investigators in the payroll, and contract work isn't deductible under the new tax law, but something about Lazarus had gotten to me. Something else about him got to me at the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, where I stopped for lunch. Mr. Spade. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm Emma Wilhelm, Mr. Spade. Emma Lazarus Wilhelm? I see you do know who I am. May I sit down? Slide in, Mrs. Wilhelm. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to know you had a sense of humor, Mr. Spade. Hmm? It's about that man, of course. Surely you didn't believe a word of his story. Which word? Oh, I'll admit there are slight traces of the truth in his raving. My first husband, Timothy Lazarus, was an embezzler. Mm-hmm. He did disappear, and it's quite true that I have collected the insurance on his life. I might even believe that Tim is still alive. But that man is not Timmy. Then what are you so upset about? Oh, it's perfectly obvious what he wants. He's an extortionist. You're wrong. He doesn't want money, Mrs. Wilhelm. He wants you. Oh, Mr. Speed, how much do you know about my husband? Which one? Don't be flippant. Dr. Ernest Wilhelm, he uh, made his first million panning lead nuggets out of gang war casualties and lost it on the stock market. He uh, cut his second million out of Knob Hill and called it surgery. He lost that on horses, blinds, and malpractice suits. The last time he was mentioned in the paper, there was a big picture of him puffing sleeping pills out of the stomach of an aging burlesque queen. It uh, may or may not have been coincidence that she did not recover and that she was the ex-girlfriend of one of our better-known racetrack haberdashers, and if he got a hundred bucks for the job, he was paid off in blue. Oh, please. Please don't say any more. That poor girl. And she'll do the same thing to me. Well. If you persist in helping that imposter, you'll be responsible for whatever happens to me or anyone else you involve. Mm-hmm. Anything else I should know? Yes. Both you and your client are being watched and followed. You can't escape him. He's not quite the has-been you'd like to think he is. After she had gone, I scraped the tears off my butter, finished my lunch, washed my hands with a nationally advertised soap, and mushed over to the great professional building. I found my client's dentist in his lab polishing up a set of gold inlays. Humboldt, oh, yes, yes, his x-rays have come through, only set today around the clamp there. Don't touch them, they're not dry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, what's your interest, uh, police identification? You guessed it. Always happy to cooperate. Thanks. How about digging in your files for the x-rays on a patient named Lazarus? Oh, yes, we're glad you, of course. <clears throat> well, let's see now. Larry, Lavelle, Lawrence, Lawson, Gluskin. That's a G. What's that doing here? Ah, Lazarus. Timothy R. Is that your name? That's the name. Oh, dear me, April 1940. Should have been in for dental hygiene. Have to remind Miss Baker. That's my next. These are uh, pictures. How do they compare with this new set? Well, now let's have a look. Switch on the light there, will you please? And let's see. Malocclusion, love, uh, that's the impacted third molar. Ah, oh, erosion in the That's yes, very interesting. You mean they're the same in both sets of pictures? Oh, dear, no, no. A uh, man's mouth could change a lot in seven years. Oh, yes, yeah, especially with dental neglect, but that would never cause a man to grow new teeth. Oh, well. You see here, Humboldt has one more lower incisor and two more molars than Lazarus. And the whole character of the mouth is different. Now, these two men would not look even faintly alike. Well, uh, could there have been some mistake in filing? Oh, dear, no. Miss Baker's been with me for ten years. Never made a mistake yet. Mm-hmm. Could I talk to her? Not in today. Been out since Tuesday. It's cold. Well, see, by the way, you're a detective. How's this for a mystery? She phoned me this morning and thanked me for sending a doctor around to examine her. Now, this is the peculiar part. I have no recollection of having done so, and I'm not acquainted with the doctor she said I sent her. That wouldn't be a Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. Why, yes. Wilhelm. That was the name. Do her another favor, will you? Call a doctor you do know and tell him to get over there as fast as he can. What's in Miss Baker's room? She's sick. Ain't heaven no calling. I'm her doctor. Oh, you can't fool me. Where's your little black bag? If I had one, it would be around your neck. Now, March, show me the way. You can't force me. I know my right. Oh, you do, do you? Well, it might interest you more that your vents are faulty, your wiring is illegal, your drains are unsanitary, and your apron is dirty. Them's rough things. 
I mean the thing. You're as mean as a mud pie. Now, get going before I have the board of health down on you. All right, but you can't make me climb them stairs. Come on, come the on. Sciatica, I have. Here's the key. Okay. First door to the right. Whatever the key is, I hope you catch it. Thank you, Elsa Maxwell. Stretched out on a bed, her left arm twisted under her and her right dangling over the edge. On the floor beneath it was an empty pill bottle. A few red capsules were scattered near it and some more were spilled out among the bedclothes. It was a standard sleeping pill suicide scene, but I didn't believe it. The body was still warm, but no pulse. I didn't waste time giving her the mirror test. Instead, I looked around for a phone. It was on a table near a window. I meant to dial the police number, set her 12020, but SU was as far as I got. Felt like a bee sting or a quick jab with a needle. I spun around and swung out blindly. The face that I missed was suntanned under a shock of iron gray hair. He was wearing the same white tooth grin that Dr. Ernst Wilhelm always wore the newspaper photographer. I started towards him and he backed away, still grinning. Come ahead, Spade. Come and get me. But hurry, you have only 20 seconds more. Shall I count them off? So far, you have three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. The floor kept dropping a foot at a time as I walked toward him. But every time I got to the bottom of the incline, it tilted up the other way and I slipped back. He kept dropping out of sight, and every time I got him back into my line of vision, he was farther away. The walls of the room opened out and disappeared into some clouds. The ceiling spun around faster and faster until it whirled away like one of those flying discs. Then the floor turned into gelatin, and I sank into it. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Lazarus Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The dream lasted about 300 years. Around Christmas time in the year 2247, another bee stung me. I opened my eyes, but the lights on the tree were too bright, and Santa Claus was bending over me with a brandy breath. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. A little willpower. You're conscious. That's it. That's it. Yeah, sensation returning. Uh, here. Try and sit up. There's a girl. How about her? Uh, too late. Did everything I could. Suicide pact. Well, one of your brothers in Apollo was a little too handy with a needle. Here's the mark on my arm, and you'll find one on that stiff. Those sleeping capsules were a plant to make it look like suicide. Uh, you'll be feeling better soon. Now, come along. Up on your feet. Must keep moving. Restore circulation. Yeah. Hip, hip, hip. There. There. Thanks. Thanks. You, uh, you the man Dr. Smith called? Yes. So you're a private detective. Uh, how do you feel now? I'm still dopey. You uh, give me something to pick me up? I've given you as much stimulant as it's safe to administer. For the rest, you'll have to sleep it off. And you will. 
I advise you to hurry home. Get into bed before this wears off. How long have I got? A mm, couple of hours if you keep moving, maybe three. Yeah. Mm, but if I were you, I wouldn't stay out. Don't want to fall asleep in the middle of Market Street, get run over by a bus. Worst things can happen to you in your own bed. Look at her. Murder? Think you can prove it? I don't know. Well, I couldn't. Not on her. And I've been an autopsy surgeon for 20 years. Well, cheer up, doctor. If you miss on her, you may get a second chance. Huh? Yeah, me. Mm-hmm. Well, those eyes are looking better. I think you'll live. I wasn't so sure. Unless I could nail Wilhelm before my three hours was up, as a safe bet he'd nail me again with that needle. He had done me one favor. He'd convinced me that my client was really the man he claimed to be and that Wilhelm and Emma knew it. My best hope of smoking him out was to dig out some solid proof. I spent ten minutes of my three hours getting the hall of records and ten more finding out there was nothing there on Lazarus but his death certificate. I had a gander at the wanted file at police headquarters. They'd checked him out in August of 47 when the court had pronounced him dead. I looked at my watch. With two hours and 17 minutes of wakefulness left, I just didn't have time. I stopped by Lazarus' hotel, got a set of his fingerprints and several samples of his signature, took them to a penman I know down on the mission, and between us we forged the most amazing set of documents ever assembled on one man. All dated, notarized, certified, witnessed, registered, one even bore the great seal of the state of California and the signature of the governor. I squeezed them all into a large briefcase, propped my eyes open with toothpicks while I drank half a gallon of black coffee, then phoned Dr. Wilhelm's night number. I told him I was one of Russian Leo's boys, and a cop had just winged me on the lamb from a jewelry store job. He agreed to meet me at his office. Hello, Wilhelm. Yes? Is that all you got to say to the guy you knocked off an hour ago? I'm afraid I don't quite follow. Who are you? Look, I know that you know, and you know that I know. They even wrote a song about it. So let's get off the dime and don't reach for a needle. This gun is bigger and it shoots farther. Well, I can see you mean business. What do you want? First, I want to show you a few things here. Take a look. Mm hmm? Well, this is very impressive. Yeah, I thought you'd be impressed. You, uh, need any more proof that Lazarus is Lazarus? What's the matter, Spade? Getting sleepy? Don't get your hopes up. I can squeeze this trigger in my sleep. Mm -hmm. Are these papers for sale? Why do you think I brought them to you? What's the price? Half the take on Lazarus's insurance. That's very high. I haven't finished. This time, Lazarus has got to be really dead, and you're going to do the job. Come on, come on, stop stalling. I can't do that. Why not? Why, Emma, she'll make trouble. She said she was. She's still in love with him? Why do you say that? I just wanted. What reason did she give you for not wanting him knocked off? Well, the cops work harder at identifying a dead man than they do a live derelict that looks and talks like a crank. I had the same idea myself. Then you're stupid. With him dead, she can tell any story she wants to. With him alive and all this proof of identity, he's in a position to nail both of you for fraud, conspiracy, perjury. Shall I go on? Uh, one thing. Does Emma know about these papers? Sure. You're lying. Sure, I'm lying. And those documents are forgeries, if that's the way you want it. I haven't got time to argue. I can't stay awake much longer, and you can't bring it off without me. I'll have Lazarus at my apartment in 30 minutes. Bring your needle and the 50 grand. All right, Spade. I'll be there. I made two phone calls on my way to pick up Lazarus, one to Emma and one to Lieutenant Erlinger of Homicide. Dundee was asleep. The lieutenant and Sergeant Fullhouse were perched on the fire escape outside my window, and Emma was waiting in the living room when we got there. Jim, oh, my poor darling. Emma, do you recognize me? Oh, of course, darling, from the beginning. But I didn't dare speak out in front of Anne. I know. Mr. Spade's told me. Now, listen to me, you two. You sure you can go through with this? Oh, are you sure there's no danger? That's him now. Oh. Come on, Lazarus, get in the bedroom there. Now, do what I told you. Oh, don't worry, Emma. Oh, I'm so frightened. Quiet. Oh. Hello, Spade. I got here just a... Emma, what are you doing here? Uh, 
Mr. Spade told me. I agreed as soon as things do. I wanted you to know that. Well, I'm glad to see that you've come to your senses for a while there. You see, you were wrong, Spade. Did you buy this stuff? Uh, here's your money. I have a hypodermic in the case here. It's already loaded. <laughs> we both need a sterile needle. <laughs> Where is he? In there on the bed. He was asleep a minute ago. The grogginess that had kept coming back over me in waves for the last two hours swirled over me again as Wilhelm leaned over the bed where Lazarus lay stretched out with his eyes closed. For a split second, I blanked out, and I was afraid it had already happened. But then I saw Wilhelm's hand coming down in the bleak angle toward Lazarus's forearm. Then my vision blurred again, and my arms felt too heavy to lift. It was Emma's scream that jolted me back. I clawed out blindly. Let go of it. You, let go of it. You, you get it in your own arm. Let go. Why, you double-crossing. Now, here's a little sleeping medicine for you. Okay, boys. Come and get him. Sam. Good boy. We won't forget this. Yeah. A likely story. I uh, get that broken glass, Paul House. Put it in the Dixie cup. I handle it careful. One analyze that medicine. You okay? Uh, who are these people, Sam? Accomplices? Yeah, but not the homicide. What about Eric? They won't let him go free, will they? Don't worry. He's out of circulation for good. Mr. Spade. Yeah, Lazarus. I, I, I don't know how to thank you. Yes. You don't know what this means to us. Uh, yes, I do. It probably means another long separation. The state prisons aren't co-ed. But if you insist on being alive, you have to take life as it comes. Well, period. Uh, end the bedtime story. Oh, Sam, it's so sad. That poor couple, so much in love. Hmm. But you had to do your duty, didn't you, hmm. Sam? Hmm? They had to pay their debt to society, of course. Hmm. That's why you had to be so hard and unrelenting and not give in to your better nature. Oh, that's right, that's right. Never give in to the ship, hmm. pal. Don't tread on me. There was uh, Hobson... Hobson... Um, yeah, what was it that Hobson... Uh, you may fire when ready? You know best, Sam. I just go tight this now. And now, listen to this. A good friend of the family. That's Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic, folks. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Now, get Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter in a new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Adventures of Sam Spade, Nashville Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie.
Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Down. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your head... Emma, you see it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep out all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. presents It's a Work of Art. Come in, uh, gentlemen. Come in. I have been waiting for you. My name is Dr. Lazarus. Dr. Lazarus, this is a surprise, sir. Dr. Lazarus, this is a pleasure, sir. Dr. Lazarus, this is an honor, sir. A great privilege to meet you, sir. And your names are? Uh, Tom Black. Dick White. Harry Brown. Joe Freeman, sir. Mm, I am delighted to welcome you, gentlemen. Delighted each of you were able to come. Be seated, please. Please be seated. Make yourselves comfortable. You've had a long journey. You must be very tired. A little tired and very confused, sir. Confused? Uh, how so, Mr. Uh, Freeman? A matter of orientation, sir. Our aircraft altered direction half a dozen times. Our car from the airfield seemed to travel a long way, yet cover a short distance. And the elevator in this building traveled so smoothly, I don't know whether it carried me up or down. Hmm. You are a man who likes to know where he is. I'm afraid so. No, no, no. No need for apology. A commendable trait. Let, let me orient you as best I may. Your location, gentlemen, is an isolated and uninhabited point in the northwest sector of the North American continent. You have descended from that point 2,500 feet below the surface of the earth. You have arrived in the confines of an installation codified as BY-7. A military installation, sir? Military? No, 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 indeed, no, indeed, no. Our purpose here is strictly non-military, sir. We are a scientific post, purely science. Pure science. Needless to add, we operate with government funds, under government contract. But uh, doesn't everyone? <laughs> uh, why, sir, is a non-military post under such stringent security? I am not free to supply that information for security reasons. Dr. Lazarus, the rest of us want to say that we have no interest where we are nor how we got here. We know we're here to do a job and we'd like to get on with it. Whatever it is. Excellent. Proper attitude. Most commendable. Now, first, your general briefing. You four men are now attached to the final phase of the operation classified as Project Adam. You have been screened, scrutinized, and selected as each of you has been found to be topmost personnel in his own field. Allow me to congratulate you on your excellence. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, your specific briefing. Project Adam was initiated 21 months ago has been in process since that time and has culminated with the completion of this installation. The installation consists of five sections. Each section contains certain specific material. Your participation is the correlation and the assemblage of that material. Oh, right. Your right. program, gentlemen, will progress as follows. Each morning for five successive mornings, 
You will report to one of the five sections in sequential order. Section A on the first morning, section B on the second, and so on through section E on the fifth morning. We assemble one section in one day, completing five sections on five successive days. Correct. On the sixth day, you will report to the project room. There, you will coordinate the five completed sections. You will assemble the total entity, the machine. The total entity is to occupy just one day. Correct. And we complete our participation in six days. Correct. On the seventh day, we test. Uh, what will we be testing, sir? The efficiency component and delivery potential of the machine. Of course. Of course. Please continue briefing, sir. Your daily log, gentlemen, is to be as follows. Report to section. Receive blueprints from me. Each set of prints will be found to be specific to that one section. Proceed according to blueprints. Complete section. Uh, sir, it would expedite matters to present us with full blueprints from the outset. That Mr. is not the schedule. Well, then we'll be working in the dark. Precisely. But if we could form a concept of the whole, if, if we could have a mental picture of the completed no machine... No one can form a concept of the whole, nor formulate a mental picture of the machine. I thought it might be possible to learn. You are a man who likes to understand what he is doing. I'm afraid so, sir. No, no, no need for apology. A commendable trait. And now, I must not keep you gentlemen from your rest. Every effort has been made to provide for your every comfort during your stay. You will be shown to your quarters. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, good morning sir. sir. And so, we begin. The beginning of the end, you might say. Hmm? <laughs> yes, 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 sir. sir. Uh, we're ready. Willing. And anxious, sir. Be good enough to gather around this screen, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I shall now project upon the screen this day's work. Gentlemen, the blueprints for Section A. It's remarkable. Mm. Good. The plans please you, do they? Mm. Marvelous, sir. It's remarkable, sir. Ingenious, sir. Most interesting, sir. I'm rather pleased myself, if I do say so. Sir, this project is a terrestrial operation. Terrestrial, Mr. Freeman? As opposed to aerospace? Yes, sir. It is terrestrial. You perceive that by observing the plans? Uh, no, sir, from thinking about the titles, Project Adam, uh -huh. and the fact that we complete a section each day and finish our work on the sixth day, uh -huh. and the fact that on the seventh day we test, we Rest on the seventh day. I don't quite follow. The creation, sir. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind. And it was so. And God said, let us make man. So God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. And the morning and the evening were the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. And he rested on the seventh day. Oh, uh, yes. That's quite certain. I never uh, realized it never occurred to me. Uh, creation, Adam. Yes, yeah, very good. That's very good indeed. Most amusing. I, I chose the word Adam as the first word that popped into my head, beginning with the letter A. First letter of the alphabet, you see, to represent this project as the first of its kind. Quite a coincidence, eh? Most amusing. And now, Dr. Lazarus... Uh... May we get to our work? If you don't mind. Sir. We're losing good time, sir. Oh, by all means, by all means, gentlemen. I shall leave you to your own good devices. Take care. Work carefully. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Can't you keep your mouth shut? Sorry. Must you blurt out whatever pops into your I head? I said I'm sorry. You sorry. ought to stop bothering Dr. Lazarus. I didn't mean to bother. It was just a thought. So stop thinking. <laughs> Section B, and there she stands. All wrapped up and ready for mailing. Mm, finished. Can't be. Seems like we just started work. That's the truth. We must be ahead of schedule. Yep. 4 p.m. on the nose. Well, it sure doesn't seem I worked eight hours. I think Dr. Lazarus would let us get into Section C right away today. Yeah. I'm not tired. You know, the way this stuff falls together, I, I could keep at it around the clock. I never worked from prints like these before. It doesn't even work. Shall we ask Dr. Lazarus to let us work straight through? No, better not. He's set the schedule. Better not throw him a curve. Huh? Mm, you're right. Man. 
Just take a look at that. <laughs> it's a beaut. Uh, honey. I wonder what it's for. What? What? I wonder what we're building. What we're building? <laughs> you know what we're building? We're building a machine. What kind of machine? Why are we building it? Why is it needed? When and where will it be used? Oh. He's talking again. I'm asking questions, not just talking. Look, what's the difference? If you ask questions, you learn something. When you learn something, you know what you're doing. It's important to know what you're doing. We know what we're doing. We have work to do. We do it. And that's all we have to know. Oh, there's more. You have to know what you're working on. You have to know what you're building. Mm. We're through for the day. Now let's go. I wonder what's for dinner. I wonder what's on TV. You've got to ask why. Why? 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 what I call a good dinner. Yep. They sure feed us good. Home was never like this. <laughs> hey, what'd you think of Section C today? Hey, bowled me over. Words don't exist to describe it. You know, you'd never believe a human brain could plan this project. Mm, Dr. Lazarus isn't human. He's superhuman. Yeah. He is a superman. <laughs> hey, hey, look. Look. Joe's still at it over there. Hey, what's he up to? What's he been scribbling? A letter home. <laughs> Since before dinner. <laughs> of... Would you miss dinner to write a letter home? <laughs> I'm going to see what I can get on TV. Hey, make it an old movie. I go for old movies. I sure would like to know what he's up to over in that corner. Well, just go ahead and ask him. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll just do that. How's he going? Uh, uh going... Oh, uh... It's rugged. Have you a problem? Yeah, a puzzle. I'm trying to make sense from the three sections we finished... Are you trying to do what? Fit the three sections together. Thought it might give me an idea what the machine will look like. You can't make them fit, huh? Now, there must be... There must be some connecting portions that we haven't worked with. And I guess Dr. Lazarus is keeping a few secrets to himself until the last minute. I'm a smart man. Good way to keep nosy people from finding out more than is good for them. Look, I tried to tell you that all I want to do is... I've heard what you tried to tell me. Now, you hear me. Don't throw a monkey wrench into the works. I'm not I say a... you are. You keep poking around. You get Dr. Lazarus down on you. He gets down on you and he comes down on the rest of us. Now, we're tied. Do you like it or not? So you just tear up that paper and put away that pencil and don't pick it up again. It's three days to tea day. Three days when you don't scribble on paper and you don't talk. And that, friend, is an order. <laughs> Get on with it over there. Get on. You're holding up the progress. What's the trouble? He's holding operations. I can't continue my area. I'm in sequence with him. I'll settle him. What's the matter? You need assistance over there? No, no thanks. You've halted. Sub area D over here. Looks familiar to me. I've worked with something like it before. Oh, forget it. Well, that's just the trouble I have forgotten for the moment. Well, forget it permanently and commence operation. Give me a moment to think. First you talk too much, then you scribble too much, now you think too much. You are dislocating the schedule, friend. I warned you last night, I'm warning you again. Is there a difficulty, gentlemen? Oh, sorry, sir, very sorry. I, I hadn't realized I that I couldn't you... resist dropping in for a brief visit. I, too, am impatient, you know. Well, gentlemen, I'm deeply grieved to find conflict among you. Uh, my fault, sir. Entirely my fault. I, uh, I annoy the other men. Oh? Do you now? In what way? I annoy them by asking questions, sir. What is your question? Why is this machine being built? So that we may learn its capacity? Capacity to do what? To perform. Perform in what direction? What is its purpose? Mr. Freeman, yours is an inquiring mind. Mankind's most precious possession is the inquiring mind. 
But such a mind must be disciplined, must control its range and limit its scope. Without discipline, self-discipline, the questioning mind is worse than useless. It is destructive, sir. I fear, Mr. Freeman, that yours is the undisciplined, inquiring mind. In what way, sir? It asks improper questions, irrelevant questions. It seeks purpose. It asks why. Would you clarify, sir? We are concerned with science. We limit our range and scope to the scientific outlook. Science investigates phenomena. It does not seek purpose. Science seeks to discover the laws governing nature and the universe, and therefore the proper question, the relevant question is, how? How was the universe formed? How was our solar system formed? How does gravity operate? How does life originate on Earth? Always. How? Never, never. Why? Never, never. Why? Yes, sir, but this machine... When you ask for its purpose, you violate the cardinal rule of scientific procedure. That rule is never anticipate experimental results. Since I must not ask why, I will ask how. I will ask... How do we know we ought to build this machine? All right, that's enough. More than enough. He does not speak for us, sir. We know we must build the machine, Mr. Freeman, because we know we must carry knowledge forward. We must take the body of information gathered for us by previous investigators, and we must enlarge it. We have been led to a point. We must go beyond that point. We must learn what happens next. The machine... Will tell us. Can I talk to you fellas just once? Gin. Uh, I have gin. Schneider, you both. Listen, you. please, just one last time. Who deals? You deal. No, I just tell. Okay. I do. We must not go any further with the machine. Tomorrow, we assemble all five sections. We must refuse. We've gone too far. We've been drawn on and on. The plans are so perfect, the parts so beautifully synchronized. We've been hypnotized. Like being drawn further and further along a garden path by the beauty of one flower bed after the other and never giving thought to where the path leads or what may be waiting at its end. But we must think about that. We must ask why the machine is being built. It's right to ask why. I can't explain it. I can't give reasons. But I know it's right and necessary to ask why we must refuse to put the machine together tomorrow. And that's Jim. Oh, no, not again. I quit. <laughs> All right, come on, pay up. Well done, gentlemen, well done. Now tell me, now that you see the machine in final form... How does it strike you? Oh, I've never been anything to match it. Never. It's a privilege to have had a hand in building it, sir. <laughs> majestic. That's what it is, majestic. <laughs> yeah, only one way to describe it. A work of art. Yep. That's a work of art. A work of art. And uh, you, uh, Mr. Freeman, you formed no opinion? It is indeed, sir. A work of art. <laughs> gentlemen, the moment has arrived. That moment we may be forgiven for calling the moment of truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have a request. Oh, no, no, please, Mr. An urgent request, sir. Very well state your request. Do not test the machine. What do you mean? At least postpone the test until you've re-examined your plans. Mr. Freeman, I have worked, reworked, and reworked my plans over a period of ten years. Do you imagine they hold any mystery for me? You've drawn the plans, sir, but I'm sure you haven't read them. Read them for meaning. You ask me to anticipate the results of an experiment? I do. You ask me to violate the basic tenets of my profession? I do. I must. If you will read your plans for meaning, you will understand what I understood after we assembled the full machine yesterday. You will realize that if ever that machine is set into operation, Silence! it's all there to be seen. It's crystal clear to anyone willing to see. Silence! I silence! Can't be silent! How can I be silent when I know that once you close the switch... Silence him! Silence him! Will you please? Pleasure! Just Get him! Don't finish it! Don't! don't. I tell you, leave me! Keep him quiet! Once, once and forever! Forever! Oh. Yeah. Uh, 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 
Well, he ought not to have forced us to such extreme action. Take stations. Ready, sir. Ready, sir. Ready, sir. Operate. Area one in operation, sir. Area two in operation, sir. Area three in operation, sir. Four. Area four. I'll get it, sir. Area four in operation, sir. Reverse the reaction. It cannot be done. Deaccelerate the fish. It cannot be done. Break the chain reaction. It cannot be done. The machine must run its course. The machine will destroy us. The machine will destroy all mankind. The machine will destroy the earth. Why? 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 Do you ask me to anticipate the results of an experiment? I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. has presented It's a Work of Art, written by Lillian Andrews, produced and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Paul McGrath, George Petrie, Bill Mason, Hal Studer, and Donald Buca. Audio engineers, Neil Pulse and Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. The greatest story ever told. Tonight we present The Resurrection, the third in a series of three Lenten dramas, The Betrayal, The Crucifixion, and The Resurrection, based upon episodes in The Greatest Life Ever Lived. Outside the gates of a Roman palace in Jerusalem, the palace of Pontius Pilate, there is now no hired mob. Only one man approaches the gate, and the guard challenges him. Who goes there? I am Joseph. Of Arimathea. I have come to see Pontius Pilate. Uh, matter of life and death, I suppose. That's what they always say. This is a matter only of death. It concerns the burial of a man. That can't wait. We'll see. Sergeant of the Guard. Man who calls himself Joseph of Arimathea wants to talk to His Excellency. Says it concerns the burial of a man. What shall I do? Have him wait. We'll see. You heard? Yes. I'll wait. Mm. 
Hey, did you hear about the excitement this morning? Yes, I did. Crazy, isn't it? Man getting himself killed over a few words. You know, they'd have let him off if he'd only said he didn't mean it. Yes. Imagine a man dying for words. Why? What's it get him? Something you Romans haven't discovered yet. Huh? Maybe not. When I saw him staggering down that road, carrying that cross on his back, I said to myself, there goes a fool or the bravest man that ever lived. He was no fool. You know, they don't come any braver than Roman soldiers. Everybody in the world knows that. But they couldn't get one of us to die just for a few words. No, sir. We've got to know what we're dying for. Land or treasure. Something real, something hard, something a man can see and feel, not just words. Guard, huh? you may bring the man in. Pilot will see him. Aye, sir. All right. Come along. I'll take you to His Excellency. Oh, it's you, Joseph. Well, what can I do for you? Your Excellency... A man has died on a cross, on Calvary. I would like to have his body released. You knew the man? I did. And you want to show him the honor of burying him? Why? Do I have to tell you why? I thought you hated him. I didn't hate him. I had nothing to fear from him. He was my friend. Friend? He was friend to every man who'd let him be a friend. And yet your people asked to have Barabbas freed instead of him. My people? Oh, no, pilot. A hired mob paid to stand outside your palace gates. A mob speaking on cue like actors on a Roman stage. They asked for Barabbas. But they told me they that... They told me. Pilot, I'm afraid as a Spanish warrior serving Rome, you're strong and cunning. But as a statesman... You're weak and innocent as a baby. How dare you speak to me that way? Since last night, I've come to dare many things. From now on, the truth will be spoken more freely in this land. For one man has shown us that it's not so hard to die for truth. Truth. Yes, I remember. I asked him, what is truth? And he answered? With his eyes only. But it was enough. Such a man deserves a decent burial. You may have the body. Thank you, Father. How will you bury him? I have a tomb which I had bought for myself. A cave carved out of rock. He shall lie there. And the manner of burial? In the custom of my people, of course. The multitude loved him. And he was one of us. How much they loved him... You'll know before long. You are threatening again. To men who bow to political expediency, any fact can be a threat. You'll find that out, pilot. Yes. You'll find that out. You sent for us, pilot. Why? I sent for you because of the way Joseph of Arimathea spoke. It had a nasty undertone. If there's going to be trouble, you'll have to patch up things or face the consequences on us. Wait, pilot. You can't be swayed by every breeze that blows. As for explaining this to the people, don't worry. We'll do that. But why did Joseph come here? Just to make threats? No. He asked for permission to bury him. And when you refused, he began making the threat? I didn't refuse. But the man deserved a decent burial, didn't he? Yes, after all, Anna's he's out of harm's way now. Don't you understand what's happened here? What do you mean? You suspect something, Anna? Of course. It's not the burial that's important. What do you think he means to do with the body if not bury it? Of course he'll bury it. But that's only the beginning. You've heard them, his disciples, talking about the fact that one day he would rise. Even he himself gave an inkling of it when he said, 
The temple would be destroyed and he would rebuild it within three days. The temple? What's that got to do with it? Everything. It was not the temple he spoke of at all, but the temple of the soul, which is the body. He meant that his body would be destroyed and that it would rise in three days. It is impossible. Uh, isn't it, Aunt? You know that? And I know that. But if the body were to be buried and then were to be secreted away in the dark by night by his followers, they could claim that he had risen and gone off by himself. Don't you see? Uh, yes, it's yes. It's too late. Joseph's claimed the body already. But we can use his own plot to confound him. We can make sure the body never arises. It stays in the tomb past the three days. We'll place a guard there. We'll seal the tomb. Place a guard? With your permission, of course. And if I refuse? Would you refuse, Pilot? I've had enough of this. I've washed my hands of the whole thing. I'm sick of it. Have you ever been in a storm at sea, Pilot? Of course. And been a little sick from time to time? I'm a soldier, not a sailor. Yes, I've been sick at sea. It's the same in this case. Sick as you may be, you're in this now. You better stay with the ship till we all reach shore. Do you understand? Joseph was right. I'm not much of a politician. All right. You may place a guard. Thank you, Pilot. Now we'll go and take care of matters. Come along, son-in-law. Yes, Anna. Halt! Captain. Have your guards roll a huge rock up to the entrance of the tomb. It must be so large that it cannot be moved even by five men. Do you understand, Captain? Yes, sir. And it must cover the whole entrance to the tomb so that none can enter it, even the smallest child. Yes, sir. We'll search for the rock at once. There is no need to do that. I noticed one as we passed by on the way. Leave two men to guard the tomb. Bring the rest of them with me. We'll put the rock in place now. A little more, men. Is that enough, Hannah? Roll it closer. There's still some space between the rock and the entrance to the tomb. Closer. All right, men. Again. Good. That's fine, fine. Now remember, two men must stand guard each hour of the day and night. Is that understood? Yes, sir. It will be done. Now, Caiaphas, there'll be no false miracles here. No disciples stealing in during the dark of night and carrying off the body. It's in there to stay. All day, back and forth. Back and forth. And what for? Who knows? Who's afraid of a dead man? Ah, oh, there's some people who think it's their duty. Their duty to find things for soldiers to do. Yeah. Like guarding a stone that guards a tomb. Oh. Well, keep walking. Wait. What? What is it? Someone's coming. Get ready for trouble. Got your spear? Yeah. But there'll be no trouble. Look, two women... This is the place, Mary. He lies here. Yes. We must wait here. And pray. The master. He suffered so. Well, what do you want here, woman? The master lies in there. We've come to mourn. No one is to loiter here. Is it loitering to mourn for the dead? Hey, wait, I know you. Aren't you the one they call Mary of Magdalene? I am. <laughs> when I'm dead, I don't want the likes of you mourning for me. You'll not talk that way to her. I'll not take orders from you either. Now, move on. Oh, please. Please allow us to remain here. Just let us stay for a while and we'll, we'll go soon without a word. You won't make any bargains with me. Come on, move on, both of you. Don't touch her. 
I'll do what I choose to do when I... Thunder. Thunder out of a cloudless sky. Thunder. The rock. It moves. It moves by itself. Tell you we saw it. Say it once more, Mary. I can't believe it. Please, Peter, she's upset. We saw it. The thunder first, and then the rock slowly rolled away. The guards were struck senseless. And then we ran to tell you, John. Oh. Please, don't weep. Can this be a trick, John? Maybe they've tried to steal his body away. Shouldn't we go and see? By all means, come, Peter. We'll go to the tomb. Oh, wait. Wait, I'll go with you. It's true. True, the rock is rolled away. Hurry, Peter, hurry. I see, John. Should... Should we go in? I... Don't know. Well, I must see. I'm going in, John. It's so dark. It's difficult to see. Wait. Feel something. The shroud. Empty. He's gone. Gone. Come, Peter. We must tell the others. We must find out what has happened here. If we can. Come, quickly. What did you find? He's gone, Mary. Gone? It can't be true. But it is. And now we must go back and tell the others. Are you coming with us? No, I'll wait here. I'll wait here. You may be in danger. Leave me. I'll wait here alone. Take care, Mary. Gone. Gone. Woman... Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? They've taken away my lord. And I don't know where they've placed him. If you are the gardener here, tell me, please. Have you removed him from here? Tell me where and I will take him away. Mary. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my father, and your father, and to my God, and your God. It can't be. It can't be. Don't shout so, Caius. Well, it's a trick. You want me to believe that the stone rolled away by itself? I don't want to believe it either, but... But what? Thunder and rock move. So it moves. So it moves. Oh, stop jabbering, you idiot, and get out of here. Come, come, we'll go. Thunder and rock rolling. Rolling and nobody there. Get out, get out! kind of a trick was it, Annis? You know about these things. You know everything. Tell me. I know everything. 
Yes. What could it have been? You're frightened. Hey, Caiaphas? Well, I'm not frightened. I'm, I'm bewildered. I, I, I don't know what... I don't know. You don't know. After all this, now you begin to realize you don't know. You're frightened, Caiaphas. I can see it in your coward's face. Now, please, Alice, please, don't talk that way to me. Maybe I have made a mistake, but I meant it only for the best for both of us. Quiet. They ran away. All his followers ran away. Like frightened sheep. Yes, and that part worked, didn't it? Did it? Well, you look at me that way. Fool, fool, fool. What is it? Yes, they ran away. And if we had kept him in jail, they would have stayed away. Well, we did better. Yes, we killed him. We did better. They'll be back. All of them. In just as long as it takes for the word to travel, they'll be... Don't you realize what has happened? He's shown them that you can die with grace and courage for an idea that you believe in. And that dying that way means more than living any other way. It's been proven. Proven. <laughs> Alice, what is it? Listen to me. Listen to you. You wonder why I laugh. You can wonder. You, a stupid fool, risen to power through lies and dishonesty. You had a hand in proving so great a thing. History has played you a strange, vengeful trick, Caiaphas. You should complain against it, for it has placed your littleness against the greatness of this thing that has happened. You miserable, lying traitor. Me? Traitor? You betrayed a whole people with this rotten deed. But as the master himself might have said, God have mercy on you. I don't like the way you're talking, Alice. We, we can brazen this thing out. If we don't, the people will take their revenge on us. Let them. I won't fight it. For I have seen it. I should have known when Pilate asked him, What is truth? And he answered only with his eyes. He is truth, Caiaphas. And truth murdered and buried will rise. As it always has. And always will. You, you believe this? You believe what has happened? Tell me, do you, Annas? I almost wish I didn't. And he spoke to me. Believe me, John. Peter. He spoke to me. We believe, Mary. And I denied him. Three times. Please, Peter, don't think of that now. You were no less courageous than the rest of us. And when he used to call us ye of little faith, I didn't know what he meant. But when danger came, we were of little faith. But now... He is risen. Risen, Peter. Will he ever forgive us for what we did? Before we deserted him, he knew and forgave. Now he sent Mary to tell us that he is risen. Come, Peter. We must gather the others. We must stand together. And from now on, we shall never be afraid again. Come. I just received the word. I came here as 
quickly as I could. Were you followed, Thomas? No, the city is quiet. No more guards than usual. Tell me what I heard. Is it true? Can it be true? Yes, Thomas. It is true. All the way here, I said it over and over to myself. And... And? I could not believe. Did you hear what Thomas said, John? Thomas. If he hadn't appeared to us after Mary had seen him, perhaps we would not believe either. But we saw him. We saw him. Now do you believe? Don't all look at me that way. Is it my fault if I'm skeptical by nature? Sometimes I wish I didn't doubt so much. I do. I cannot believe unless my doubts are satisfied. But the rest of us believe, Thomas. Have I ever been like the rest of you? Wanted to be? I'm not. When he lives... He still lives, I tell you. Please, Peter, let him say it in his own way. Thank you, John. When he lived, he indulged my doubts. He explained to me. Taught me patiently. Now that he's gone, I'd be content with less... Want to believe? I want to believe. Please, Thomas. You must understand, John. I can't believe. Not until I see the nail wounds in his hands. The wound the soldier's spear made in his side. Else, I will not believe. Master... Master, it is he. Master, it is you. Peace be to you. Master, Master, you know me well. I am Thomas, and being Thomas, I doubt. I must have proof before I believe. Thomas, reach out thy finger and behold my wounds. Yes, Master. The nail wounds. The wounds. And bring hither thy hand and put it into my side. A wound of the soldier's spear. Oh, master, master. And be not faithless, but believing. My Lord and my God. Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen.
Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen of the Catholic University of America will now deliver the last in his series of 17 addresses on the general subject, peace. His discourse today is entitled, The Resurrection. I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends. Celebrating Easter in a world that is more like a Good Friday and hearing the chants of peace amidst the explosions of war makes us wonder what lesson this blessed feast could have for these tragic days. The answer is to be found in two distinct scenes in the life of our Lord. The first scene took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Savior in the full majesty of his person goes out to meet the devil in the guise of Judas. He surrenders himself into the hands of Judas and the soldiers with these words. This is your hour. And the power of darkness. The important word here is hour. For apparently evil has its hour and uses it to turn out the light of the world and to deliver it over to the Stygian darkness of despair. The second scene took place earlier in the Lord's life, when the Pharisees sought to get rid of him by making him fearful of Herod, whom they said intended to kill him. The supreme value of the story is in the answer our Lord gave. In effect, he said... Go tell that fox who has a mind to kill me that he is helpless. He cannot kill me until I have done my work and I have three days' work to do. This was figurative language. Two of these days are for works of convincing men of his divinity. But the third day will be the day of mystery and perfection. The important word here is day. Put the two scenes together, and there emerges this lesson. Evil has its hour, but God has his day. And that evil hour is inseparable from God's day. One with it unless the seed has its hour when it falls to the ground and dies. It will never have the day when it rises forth to newness of life. Without the war with evil in its hour, there will never be the day of peace. Unless there is a good Friday in our lives, there will never be an Easter Sunday. Unless there is a crown of thorns, there will never be the halo of light. Unless there is the scourged body, there will never be the glorified body. And there is the answer to the question of Easter. How can we celebrate Easter in a world that is like a Good Friday? By seeing in this war the operation of God's law that without this hour of suffering and sacrifice, we might never come to a national resurrection. Did we but realize it, peace is not a passive but an active condition. It is not something that is given. It is something that is achieved. Our blessed Lord never said, Blessed are the peaceful, But he did say, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace must be made. It must be won in a battle. Good Friday was not a day of appeasement. And therefore, Easter was not a day of false peace. 
God hates peace in those who are destined for war. Evil has its hour, but God will have his day. And so much is that hour of suffering and tragedy a part of the day that in the triumph of his resurrection, our divine Lord keeps the scars that he received in the hour of his defeat. And he keeps those scars for all eternity. And on the last day, when he shall come in the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead, he will show them as pledges of his victory. He is a prince of peace. But only because he was once a captain of oars and the Lord of hosts. Soldiers wear medals for bravery. But he wears his glorious scars as radiant suns in hands and feet and, feet and side. Scars that he received the day that he fought in the battle for peace. The Via Crucis is the Via Pacis. The way of the cross is the way of peace. To pass through that hour of evil alone and in itself is no guarantee that we will have peace. We have to pass through that hour with him. The thief on the left on Good Friday had his hour, but it was not born in union with our divine Lord. And therefore it profited him nothing. The thief on the right, on the contrary, passed through his hour in union with Christ. And therefore came to his day. And our Lord called it just that. This day. Paradise. And St. Paul has said, This saying is true. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. Now apply this lesson that only those who pass through Calvary's hour with him shall ever come to the day of victory. Look out upon the nations of the world, except our own. Look at Holland, Belgium, France, Germany, Finland, Italy, Philippines, Greece, Russia, the Balkan states, Mexico, and Spain. Think of how many are suffering in these lands. And I speak only of those who are in these lands are suffering in the name of Christ. There must be hundreds of thousands of them in these lands. They are having their hour. Their hour of darkness, of famine, and of hate. Above all the battlefields of the world, beyond the din of national slogans, the scheming of foxes, the debates of politics, the selfish classes of economic forces, there is one common bond uniting them all. They are all prostrate before the cross of Christ. They have all been kissed by some Judas, smitten by some soldier, misjudged by some Caiaphas, mocked by some Herod, crucified under some Pilate. And in this their hour of darkness, they have a pledge that if the Easter law holds true, and it does, to the extent that their sufferings are one with him, they will rise again. Not because of any reshuffling of politicians or any new theory of economics will they rise. For politics again will fail. Economists again will blunder. Foxes will be caught in their own traps. Schemers will be caught in their own schemes. But because these hundreds of thousands of chosen souls have been signed with the sign of the cross and sealed with the seal of salvation... Because they have borne their cross in Christ in that hour, 
They will rise with Christ. This war to them is the sowing of a seed. Evil has its hour, but God will have his day. Apply this lesson now to our own country. If it be true that those who have already had their hour with Christ will have their day with him, then the inverse is true. We shall have our day of victory only on condition that we have an hour of darkness with Christ. We want victory in America. We all want it. Victory with justice. But Easter teaches us that there can be no day of victory unless we pass through the hour of struggle against evil and in union with the Savior. As our risen Lord told the disciples at Emmaus, Know you not that the Son of Man must suffer in order to enter into his glory? It is the only way we can enter into glory. And we Americans have already begun to pass into that hour, that hour of sacrifice. We've not chosen it. It has been forced upon us by our enemies. But we're in it. And like the Savior on Calvary, we are already being stripped. As he was... But we are being stripped of our rags of self-righteousness. And as we're stripped of these, we'll begin to be great. First of all, we are beginning to die to that false notion that there's no such thing as evil. How often we have said in America in our schools in the last generation, there's no distinction between right and wrong. Good and evil are only points of view. There's no absolute. But now, we're dying to that false notion. We are all pointing our fingers across the seas, to both, across both seas, and we're saying, they're evil! They're wicked! These men are devils. Well, if they're wrong, then there must be a right. And if there's a devil that wars with God, there must be a God. We're being forced onto God's side. And we're being stripped, too, of another rag. The false rag of self-expression. There are a few reactionary educators in the United States. We have not yet caught up to the tempo that wins the war. Who are still talking about self-expression. They want no discipline, no authority, no restraint. But fortunately, we're being stripped of that now by the war. And sacrifice is being imposed upon us. And now, like Nicodemus, we're beginning to see that nations like men must be reborn before they can live. And finally, we're being stripped of another rag, the rag of progress. We've been saying up to this time that progress was in an ascending straight line. That the mere fact that we lived, we got better. The blind cosmic forces were sweeping us on until we became kind of supermen. But this war reveals to us just the contrary. Namely, that no life becomes better unless it dies to a lower self. This spring which we are now enjoying is not an ascending progress from last spring. 
It is the result of the death of the old one. And so must all nations and civilizations die in this hour of darkness before they will come to the day of their victory. There will be an hour of humiliation. Of this there is no doubt. Our choice as a nation is not between being humbled and not being humbled. The choice is, who shall humble us? Will it be our enemies? Or will we humble ourselves? Let me put it bluntly this way. Would we, as a defeated nation, be more moral, more just, and more Christian than we would as a victorious, revengeful nation? If we would be more moral as a defeated nation, then we may expect from God to be defeated. That is the only way that we could be bettered. We'll go down to it. But fortunately, it is not the only way. Instead of being humbled by enemies, there is another way we can humiliate ourselves by recognizing that only by and through our share with the redemption of Christ can we pass through that hour that will bring us to the day of peace. And if, therefore, we pass through that hour in such a way that labor lifts up its hand as Christ lifted up his in the carpenter shop in service of a father, and if capital like Joseph of Arimathea gives of its wealth for the service of Christ, if women like Magdalene will bring their spices to anoint him, if educators like Nicodemus will come in the dark to find the truth that is his, if soldiers like the one at the foot of the cross share the wine of their life with him, if we all begin to see him wounded in the wounded, hidden in the lost, destitute in the destitute, if we enter this work of sacrifice as he entered the garden, then we need never fear the outcome. Why, we've already won! Only the news has not yet leaked out. We shall have our day of victory in him if we first have our hour of darkness with him. And if there is anything that adequately describes this Easter message, it is that of the eagle. Eagles build their nest high in the mountains, generally overlooking cliffs and precipices and abysses. When finally the young are hatched, the mother eagle, in virtue of an instinct implanted in her, begins to stir in that nest and scatter the twigs that cradle the infancy of its young. It nudges one of the eaglets to the edge of the nest, and it shrinks back again in safety. But the mother bird, through the infallible urge of the Creator, finally succeeds in pushing the young over the edge of the nest. Down and down it falls, its feeble wings fluttering in vain to bear it up against what must seem to it as catastrophe and death on the rocks below. But just before the eaglet crashes in the fearful depths, the parent bird swoops under it, gathers it upon its great wings, bears it aloft into the sky, and there debarking its living cargo allows the young one to flutter again and to fall, but not to death. Again the mother bird catches that cargo on its great pinions, lifts it up into the sky, and on and repeats the process until the bird has learned to fly. And Moses, looking out upon a scene of that kind in his own land, said that as the eagle stirreth the nest of its young, so does God stir up the nations. So does God stir up the nations. In other words, we have been like those little eaglets, quite satisfied with the little nest of this world of ours, smug, satisfied, and self-complacent. We forgot that we had immortal souls, 
We forgot that our souls had wings and were destined for God and can carry us to heights above the earth. And because we forgot this destiny, God had to stir in this nest of America to unearth us from our smug worldliness and to make us realize that we had another destiny and to bring us possibly within the very edge and to the edge of disaster before he would lift us up as an eagle bird does and carry us back again to the God for whom we were made. And that is indeed an apt figure of America. For America chose as its national symbol not the lion seeking whom it may devour, not the sly fox laying in wait for its prey, not the vulture flying above waiting for its carrion, but America in the full consciousness of what we were all supposed to be chose as its symbol the eagle flying upwards and onwards beyond the sky, up past the troubled gateways of the stars, across the margin of the world, beyond the hid battlements of eternity, up through that hour of darkness to the day of everlasting victory with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy heareth the prayers of sinners, pour forth we beseech thee all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war, we pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together forever. O oh, dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. This concludes my series of broadcasts for this season. It shall be my honor to be with you again the first of the year, on January the 3rd, to be exact. Your response to the Holy Hour has been marvelous. In a small town in North Carolina, for example, where there was no church, 14 souls under the inspiration of a colored school teacher expressed a desire to come to the fullness of the faith of our Lord. We are going down there this summer, and with the gracious permission of Bishop McGinnis, preach a mission in that little town and start the first Catholic church in that community. Such things are very encouraging. For you must know that the Catholic hour has no other standard of success except to bring souls to our divine Lord. If these broadcasts of mine did nothing more than to bring but one soul in the United States to the feet of our blessed Savior, then they would have been eminently worthwhile. Please. Please do not discontinue your daily holy hour. America is still at war, and we want America to be on God's side. It will be all right for the sheen to wear off, but don't let the holy hours wear out. And before I take leave of you, my blessing to each of you to every Jew, and to every Protestant, and to every Catholic. I hope that you are closer to God just because you listened. And this personal note, it's a little secret. I am on relief. I come to you begging. 
The relief that I want is your prayers. Would you, whomsoever you be, be so kind as to breathe a little prayer for me occasionally, that I may be a good priest and bring souls to God? That is the only thing in the world that matters. You have been tuning into me. Now I want to tune into you. If you will drop me a note assuring me that you will contribute a prayer to my relief, I shall send you a letter of thanks. In the meantime, I shall meet you every day in the holy hour. Au revoir. May Almighty God bless you. May his divine Son extend to you the merits of his redemption, and may the Holy Spirit sanctify you. And may Our Lady protect you and watch over you and keep you safe. Bye now. Bye. God love you. Oh.